Hassan Hassi and I have been working together for a very long time. Probably been in touch with him one way or another every day for the last 10 years. I think we first met probably in 2006 or 2005. I worked on his first book, The Beautiful Struggle, and then we transitioned into uh, Between the World and Me, which we published in 2015. And then I worked with him on We Were Eight Years in Power, which was his last nonfiction work, and of course, The Water Dancer, we've been working on for a while. I began what became The Water Dancer under this notion of writing about an interracial family in uh, Virginia. And I wanted it to be polyphonic. It was actually going to be four voices. It just didn't come to anything. And so he made some somewhat halting attempts at um, starting the novel and then stopped. His journalistic career really took off when he became a staff writer at The Atlantic. His blog became hugely popular with millions of people reading it. He started to write these pieces that were like seminal works of narrative journalism for The Atlantic that kind of culminated in his piece, uh, The Case for Reparations. Over the time he was working on the blog and on his journalism, he got deeper and deeper and finally got kind of caught as some people do, like when you start really getting into the Civil War, you realize this is like the most fascinating story in American history. <laughs> I read a ton. You know, I read about furniture. I read cookbooks from the period. I read books on how to like, basically how to tend, you know, a house. I read a lot of first person narratives. I read a lot of WPA narratives of formerly enslaved black people. I read a ton of memoir from the period. I visited a ton of places. I, I went down to Monticello. Uh, I went to the Whitney Plantation. I went to Civil War Battlefield. I went to Shirley Plantation in Virginia. In the course of investigating, you know, doing this book and doing more research on the war and on slavery, he returned to the idea that it captured him years before about this slave on this plantation in Virginia. But now he had much deeper understanding of what that slave's life and experience and world would have been. And then he connected it to this idea of a magical power um, that came out of uh, his reading of William Still's Records of the Underground Railroad and reading about Harriet Tubman's life and reading about sort of the, the magic of the experience of escape. And that connected a lot of dots for him in terms of how to turn this one person's life into the magical epic, I think, that he wanted to write. I felt like African-American history, again, is often presented like eat your vegetables. And I wanted something closer to like Lord of the Rings. Thank you guys. <laughs> Some uh, kid asked me this question last time I was here about uh, whether white people could use the word nigga or not. And <laughs> when I, that answer to that question, I think has been more circulated than anything I have ever written. <laughs> and, and I think the curiosity, because apparently a lot of white people want to answer to that question. <laughs> Um, I think the, the, you know, the um, curiosity about that question probably says something more than the uh, answer to the question itself. Um, but it was funny because just when I was coming here today, my old editor-in-chief, he said he was at, you know, um, his kid was at school today, and the kid read something I had written, and I got really, really excited about it. Um, but it actually turned out to be the answer to that question. It was a video of me answering that question. So it's good to be back. Um, Let's make some more magic tonight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm the author of this, uh, this book, The Water Dancer, um, which is the story of, uh, I guess that's why I'm here, um, <laughs> which is the story of Hiram Walker. Hiram Walker is an enslaved uh, African-American in Virginia whose father is his enslaver and has sold away his mother. Um, Hiram has a preternatural memory. Uh, he can remember you know, almost everything in detail and repeat it back to you, uh, except those uh, details which are most intimate to him. Uh, in this case, uh, the loss of his mother, who he does not remember at all. Um, Hiram Walker once, with all uh, four million enslaved uh, African Americans uh, wanted uh, during the antebellum period, and that is their freedom. 
Uh, but his story is the discovery that uh, freedom uh, is not an individual undertaking, at least not for black people. Um, and he has to come to the understanding that his freedom is ultimately tied to uh, several other people's freedom, even people's freedom who he um, doesn't actually know at the onset of the novel. Um, <clears throat> one of the uh, people who, uh, who he encounters, spoiler alert, uh, cover your ears, um, you don't want to be spoiled. Um, but one of the people he encounters in the novel is Harriet Tubman. And this novel in many ways started with you know, some of my, you know, I guess, honestly, some of my earliest you know, introductions to Harriet Tubman as a child, but later proceeded as I read uh, several books. And um, you know, I was semi-joking in, in, in that uh, video about how uh, black history is so often pre presented as each of vegetables and I wanted Lord of the Rings. But if you read about Harriet Tubman's life, it is as adventurous as any sort of you know, Lord of the Rings epic. And one of the stories that always really affected me and, and caused me actually to even come to this book in the way I, I did was her return south to uh, rescue two of her brothers and, and their wives. Uh, Harriet Tubman's dad uh, was free. Uh, her mother was enslaved. At some point, the father uh, buys the mother out of slavery. But they are still held as suspicious. You know, being free uh, on the eastern shore of Maryland was not like being a, a free white person. Uh, and so there are all sorts of strictures that they're under. Harriet Tubman returns uh, to the eastern shore of Maryland, to the south, uh, where she was from, to liberate her siblings and, 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 uh, and uh, um, their wives. And though she's been back several times, and her father has seen her a few of those times, and her brothers have seen her a few of those times. Her mother can't see her. She can't see her mother. And she can't see her mother because her, her mother is a really, really emotional person. And Harriet fears that if her mother sees her, she'll start screaming. And then, you know, when white people come to interrogate the family, she won't be able to hold the secret. So when she comes back on this time uh, to free the brothers and sisters, they wait in a barn behind the house. But none of them go see the mother. And the mother who's expecting them, because in the real version of this is actually Christmas, keeps walking out to the road to see uh, her sons who she thinks are, are coming to see her, and, and they never come. And then she, you know, they, they make their escape, and the father walks with them as far as he can, and he blindfolds himself. And he says he blindfolds himself, as you'll you know, see in the reading, because when they ask, has he seen Harriet, or has he seen his, his sons, he can honestly say, no, I have not. And I was always so moved by, 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 that, by that scene. Um, it, it, it reflects us in a, in a kind of human way, and not to go on a tangent, but you know, one, of, one of the reasons why I, I wrote The Water Dance is because I thought even in the literature of enslavement, I'm not convinced that we always um, come off as human beings. And that inability to come off as human beings uh, has consequences even today. Um, it is the reason why you can, um, it's the reason why you can walk into somebody's apartment. Um, <clears throat> and you can shoot them down while they're eating a bowl of ice cream. And the legal system can claim that you have castle doctrine. As a buddy of mine said, everywhere white people go is their castle. And then when you're convicted, people give you hugs. And they give you Bibles. Now listen, family member grieving, they, they, you know, they can process however they want. But when you see officers of the court doing that, stroking your hair, I am all for forgiveness. But I have a hard time believing that if my son had walked into somebody's apartment, and shot down some blonde white woman while she was eating a bowl of ice cream, that they would have hugged him, stroked his hair, and given him a Bible. The essence of that is not simply law and policy. It's who you believe is human and who you do not. And how you determine or how you um, embody, how you advance the idea of who is human and who is not is in our literature. It's in our arts, it's in our movies, it's in our, it's in our culture. 
And so in writing The Water Dance, I was deeply, deeply concerned uh, with that. I I'm sorry about that tangent. I've been thinking about that <laughs> all day. <laughs> <clears throat> So here is um, Harriet Tubman with her brothers and sisters. This is a very, very short passage um, at the moment uh, when they're about to leave. Ben and Robert are her brothers. Ma Ritt is her uh, mother. And Pop Ross is her dad. Now the rains started up. Ben and Robert peered through a crack in the stables which framed the back window of the main house. And through that window, they would see Ma Ritt lit up by the fire, puffing on a pipe with the forlorn weight of her missing children all over her face. Harriet, who had not seen her mother in years, did not want to see her now. She could not look through the crack. She would risk no farewell, even a distant one. Finally, Marit extinguished the flame and went to bed. I looked out and saw that a heavy fog had rolled in. Now Harriet inspected each of us. It was time. We walked out. I saw Pop Ross at the door blindfolded. When they ask, have I seen any of you, he said, I shall answer with my word upon God that I have not. We walked out into the fog. Jane took one of the old man's arms, Henry took the other, and we fell into the muddy woods. And as we walked, Harriet's father hummed quietly to himself, then took up the familiar tune of departure and one by one, they too picked up the song and it was delivered in a low, quiet murmur through all of our party. Going up to the Great House Farm, going on up, for they done me wrong. Day so short, Jaina, night so long. Then the woods broke and we came upon a wide pond, the length of which we could not see past through the fog and the dark. The voices lowered until the only sound was the rain against the leaves above and the falling water rippling against the still water. Well, old man, Harriet said, turning to her father, time for me to take over. I think they must have all gotten some understanding of what was to happen because as soon as Harriet said that, Jane and Henry broke their embrace and everyone stepped into the water. Henry, Robert, and Ben formed a line at the front facing out onto the pond. Jane took my hand and pulled me right behind them. I looked back and saw Pop Ross standing there blindfolded. Harriet walked over to him, circled once as if to take up every inch of him for her memory, then kissed him gently on the forehead. Then she touched his cheek and I saw the green light of conduction pushing out from her hand. And by that light, I saw the tears streaking down Pop Ross's face. They stood like this for a few moments. Then Harriet turned and took her place in front of her brothers and started walking out into the depths. Her brothers followed silently and Jane and I followed them. Only I looked back and when I did, I saw Pop Ross there still blindfolded. And as we moved deeper into the pond, I watched him slowly sip away from us, slip away as memories sometimes do into the darkness into the fog. Thank you. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, you know, my, my goal coming to this was to make this as interesting as possible because I know that we both probably sat through a lot of these that are not that. Mm. Um, <laughs> maybe you all have to. <laughs> but I was so, I wanted to start out because I was so interested by seeing something about how you came to writing. Mm. Your parents making you write essays as punishment because mm. that was what my parents were on too mm. when I was young. Mm. And I think that's such a hard punishment to explain now mm. because I think so much of punishment as I've seen it enforced now involves the removal of things mm. or the taking away mm. of pleasures mm. uh, instead of the directive mm -hmm. to do something, mm -hmm. labor in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and also it's hard to explain because at least, at least with my parents, they would enforce this punishment on like a nice day, mm -hmm. you know, like spring break. Right. They remember right. that shit that I did months right. earlier. Right, right, It'd right. be like 5,000 words, you right. know what I mean? Um, <laughs> for you, I'm, I'm interested in how that manifested itself for you and how that made you love writing and not resent it. Yeah, I mean, it, it manifested itself by my mother telling me sit at the table and write. Um, and I don't, that, that, but that wasn't my only touch point to writing. You know, um, you know, Hanif is a, is a, is a brilliant 
uh, not just a brilliant poet, but, but uh, a, a brilliant critic of music. Um, and that sounds, um, you can clap. You can go ahead, go ahead and clap. Lottie's into it. Thanks to the seven of Igor and Mike. No, but it's a thing that, that sounds um, significantly harder, uh, or significantly easier than it actually is. It's quite, you know, I think this as somebody who started off as a mediocre music critic. Um, and it's very, very hard to make, you know, music uh, and to talk about why music actually, you know, moves you, and much less to do it in a beautiful way. But I, I say that as, as way of saying, um, <clears throat> like, like, like myself, you know, uh, Hanif is a huge hip hop fan, and writing is at, is at the core of hip hop. You know, um, it was especially at the core of it. You know, um, in the, you know, I guess late '80s, '90s period, I, I was coming up, and and so I, I had writing all, all around me. You yeah. know, um, I, I was aware that that was written down. I was aware when I heard, you know, say Gil Scott Heron, "Revolution," you know, would not be that he had written something. The last words had written something. Even you know, music that was sung that had beautiful lyrics to me. I was aware that it was you know written. I was aware that the comic books that I loved were written. The, the Dungeons and Dragons books that I had around me were written. The um, books about black people that, that, that were, oof, I hope that wasn't me. Let's hope that doesn't happen again. Um, I, I, I was aware that um, all of that, that, was, that was written. What I did not understand quite was how one made a career out of doing that. Um, it took a long time before I understood that. Actually, I was a grown adult before I actually got that figured out as a practical matter. Um, but I didn't, I liked that one could write for oneself. I really loved that, that you could you know, do things that you wanted to do you know, with, with your imagination. Right. And so I always did that, even with the influence of my mom. I'm, and I'm, I'm resisting the urge to not talk to you about hip hop at length, but maybe we'll get to the end. Okay. My, <laughs> Um, okay, all right, we're good. My introduction to slavery, my introduction to American slavery was through folklore and mythology. The Virginia Hamilton book, The People Could Fly. Uh, Virginia Hamilton in Ohioan, by the way. Um, and there was something about that entry point, you know, and of course I was young. It's not like I was like 21. Um, I was young, and so I didn't understand, the, I understood first the potential magic that rested in escapism and freedom before I understood the actual horrors and personal toll that slavery took on people. Um, I'm interested in how you first came into contact with stories of slavery and stories of that part of America's history. Such a great question. Um, so I learned to read at a relatively early age, um, before I went to school, and it probably would have been in the children's books that, that were around me. Um, it's so interesting hearing you say that because the magic of it, you know, even reading the people, you know, uh, could fly, which I was, you know, which I had, the magic of it only came to me lately. I, you know, and every person is different. I don't, I don't know if this is like um, because of how I was raised. I don't know if it was uh, the time period I was raised in, but I felt like that in general, the history of black people was presented as one of suffering, um, one of great physical suffering, and people just beating on you. And that was like my earliest like, thoughts about you know, slavery, my earliest images you know, of, of slavery. There, there wasn't too much in my recollection, or at least that caught me on the interiority of the lives of enslaved people. Um, and even, the presentations of people like Harriet Tubman mm -hmm. um, and Frederick Douglass, at least as I process them, you know, they're always, they always seem so flat. You know, I was saying the other night, like I, I, you know, I didn't realize until I was much later that say for instance, you know, Thurgood Marshall presented to you as you know, first black justice, Supreme Court. I didn't realize he was a terrible student at Lincoln. <laughs> yeah. And that he used to cut yeah, up and yeah, was horrible yeah. and would play jokes and all of that. Like th th those little, <laughs> you know, small things. Um, I, I don't have as much recollection, uh, probably, and if I thought about the question more, some, something closer would come, but like I, I read Douglas's autobiographies relatively early, and I remember feeling like they were really beautifully written, but I didn't have to, like I couldn't quite get inside of them, you know what right. I mean? It, yeah. it just felt a little too, 
heroic. And the magic hadn't quite hit me later. Now, I will say that I read that stuff later, and then I, I could see it. You know, so I wonder if that has as much to do with me as, as, as what was right there. Right. And I also think, too, even in mythologies and folklore, like black folklore, the things placed at the forefront, I think about John Henry often. Right. Yes. How even yes. through John Henry. That might have been my earliest awareness right there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I thought John Henry story was terrifying. Oh, it was terrifying. He died. Yeah, he dies. He died. Working for what? Like yeah. wh what? And it was told to me in school, right? As right, a, exactly. As a, it was held up as like a beacon of American labor. Right? And he's heroic. And he's heroic. And so um, with that, I was um, there was there are many things I want to talk about within the book, but I'm interested in how you arrive at finding the magic to extract this particular magic, right? This idea of conduction. Um, sorry for spoilers for those of you who have not read it. But it happens early in the book. Yeah, it's, it's like in the first few pages, so you'll be fine. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but how you arrived at not just magic, but that particular magic and the idea of memory. I was so interested and invested in reading the book. Um, and this is my own reading into it and my own cynicism in some ways. Um, of having a character who in some ways has the superpower of memory um, when we live in a country that is so eager to forget its own history, right? Yeah. For the yeah. sake of it. So I was interested in how you arrived at those particular superpowers. Well, what I write there was a huge part of it. I think the first thing to recognize is if you read the narratives of that period uh, from enslaved uh, black folks, which I, which I did a lot of, magic is, is everywhere. You know, mysticism is, is everywhere, it's all over. I mean, again, Frederick Douglass, when you know, he's escaping, he talks about you know, this enslaved black dude who gives him this special route you know, that's gonna give him powers to help him escape. Um, in the oral histories, people talk about putting like uh, uh, graveyard dust in their shoes to throw off hounds. I mean, yeah. there's all sorts of stuff that's, that's all through the actual narratives. And so I just kind of took it seriously. You know what I mean? Like, I, I presume that from their world, where these, these people um, existed in a world where supernatural things actually did happen. And so once I did that, it really wasn't hard to, you know, actually work with, you know, something like conduction. Even the word like superpower makes my skin crawl a little bit. And I'm not saying you're, you're not wrong for saying that. Yeah. But um, Hiram exists in a world where it's presumed things like that happen. Right. You know? Um, and so. It, it didn't feel as much like a leap for me as it felt like, I think, for you know, a lot of people uh, who read it. Um, I, I, even in novels, you know what I mean? Um, it's not like Beloved is a straight ahead story. Right. It's a ghost story. It's a ghost story, yeah. You know what I mean? So um, I, I, I didn't feel that, that far out of a limb on that. In, in terms of the actual specifics of it, you know, I, I think in a lot of my writing, I, I've been very interested in history, the weight of history, the weight of forgetting. You know, and how um, the weight of forgetting actually is often, you know, uh, much, much heavier than, than the weight of remembering. Um, but people don't want to do the remembering, so they just kind of accept the, you know, right. the, the passive, you know, dangers and, and, and uh, problems of, of forgetting. Um, and so I was interested in, in talking about that through, uh, through Hiram. I was really, um, because the conduction appears so early in the book, and it's not often explained, right? Like you said it right there, you live the, the the characters, Hiram and the characters live in a world where these things are expected to happen. I'm wondering what fiction, what you feel fiction affords you with regard to being against explanation. Because I think often about, um, if we were to talk about music criticism, I grew up reading like Lester Bangs and yeah. Briel Marcus, critics I love, but who wrote to me as though I already knew who the Beatles were, right? Lester Bangs wrote about the Clash as if I were five albums deep into their catalog and had to, and there was a generosity in that, in, under, in, in entering my world um, with, the expect, with the expectation that I would catch up and fall in love on my own without explanation. And I know that sometimes in nonfiction work, it is harder to, to negotiate what is what to be explained, what to not be explained, to whom are we explaining, particularly as marginalized writers. Um, and I'm interested in what you found fiction afforded you um, in an opportunity to go against explanation. Yeah, I, that's a great question. Um, I, I think the first thing is, um, I don't want to put up barriers in my work. Um, like, I, I should say unnecessary barriers. I, I don't you know, want to get into a space where the words become some sort of like in joke. Um, the book is written to be read. Um, at the same time, um, I do think not having 
See, I can't even say that because I, I felt like I like even in my nonfiction, I had a big thing. I mean, you, you, you do have to explain, you know, to some extent. I mean, it's, a, it's an expository form, you know, almost always. But I think I always tried to write under the notion that the reader would catch up. You see, I think writing can work on, on several levels. And, you know, I, yeah, I know you must think about this as, as a poet. Um, very often, you're reading something, and you may not know what it means, and you may not know what it's saying, but you love how it sounds. You know, I'll give you an example. When I was, you know, I'm a you know, much younger person in college, you know, wanted to be a poet, I would, you know, I was absolutely in love with Yusef Kuminyaka. Mm -hmm. And I would read him, and I would have no idea, like, what... <laughs> But he was nice with his, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. I read it and he just, you know what I mean? He sounded beautiful. Yeah. And so I would read it over and it would almost be an incantatory, you know, effect, you know, uh, from the poetry. And same thing with hip hop. It's not like every time, you know, you listen to rock him, you know what rock yeah. him is saying. Yeah, Ghostface. You know, Ghostface, Ghostface is a great, no unreliable idea. narrator of... No yeah. idea what's going on. And, yeah. you know, and, and it'll be years later and you'll say, oh, that's what was happening. Yeah. You know? Um, and so... I feel like literally understanding everything that's happening is one level of, of communication. Um, you can communicate with people on other levels. You know, um, there's, you know, the way, you know, senses are structured and, and put together that can deliver a feeling of, of, of how something is. And obviously, yeah, you're right. I mean, in fiction, you have to do considerably less, you know, than that. You know, I, I always wanted it to be gettable, though. You know what I mean? I didn't want it to be some sort of in-joke. Right. Where in, if you went back and read it, you know what I mean? It was like, what's going on here? You right, know? right, right. Yeah, I love Kumiyaka. I open every year by reading Neon Vernacular. It's collected poems. You oh, should buy it. It's a great book. That's the uh, one I carried that around. Like, yeah, oh my it's perfect. God. It's a I, don't great, great book. I still don't understand it all. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, but I also think there's something about poetry and about fiction and about any mythology building when you build a mythology until mythology becomes fact, right? Or you, you build the world until it most resembles a world that can be lived in. Um, which, this has nothing to do with anything, but, well, it has something to do with the book, but only as a side thing. Was meeting Oprah cool? Oh, that has a lot to do with the book. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's a yeah. big Oprah seal on the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. It's pretty cool. It's really cool. And, and, and the coolest thing about it is... Um, like, Oprah's a legit literature fan. Yeah. <laughs> like, legitimate. <laughs> like, this is not, like, like, this is not cynical. This isn't, you know what I mean, a branding exercise. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, when she called to talk about the book, she had questions. She broke down crying. You know, I, I wasn't going to say it, but she said that publicly now. I wasn't going to say it myself. Now I can say it. <laughs> you know, I don't want to risk the wrath. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but she said it, so I'll say it. But she broke down crying. I mean, she, um asked about things like little like small things like what's a seven and nine which is like a term in the book yeah you know like little small things and then like weeks later was like texting about the book what happened here that what was that about wow. you know what i mean so it was like legit you know what I mean? like, she's a legit reader you know what i'm saying and so um i anytime i, I meet a reader that, that that's that deep in it's obviously gratifying but if yeah. you meet a reader that deep in that's gonna put your book or make your book available on everybody's iPhone. <laughs> then you want another level. <laughs> of all the people I've made cry in my life, no one's ever reached the level of Oprah. So. <laughs> work to but do. it was the work. I mean, I don't yeah. wanna say I did it because, and I mean that because it's the work because it's not just, you know, the cool thing about reading is, is you know, you put down the words and the person brings something to it right. and then that causes the, uh, the emotional, you know, reaction. But um, no, I mean, I, I think, um, and then just the way that she's promoted it, you know, across Instagram, I mean, it just, um, it's, it's been stunning, absolutely stunning to watch. So yeah, yeah it's been pretty cool. Um, <laughs> back to, the, back to the, the book, the work of the book and how it's lived, not with Oprah. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by- I don't by know how to talk about that. You know that? I don't know. <laughs> such a shadow. I don't even know how to, how to discuss that. Go ahead, though. Um, the research. I'm a big fan of research, and I think research is the writing happening, right? I think if you research well enough, by the time you return to the page, the writing writes itself. And um, I mean, just notoriously, you know, in your, in your nonfiction work, it's just so research, saturated with research, and really kind of bulletproof 
you know, source why, you know, it's just like you're, you're, you are someone who it seems is very passionate about research and that did not let up. I didn't see, I didn't feel like that let up in this book. It felt like there was a lot of research put in the book. So what was that process like? You? Yeah, you know, the difference is obviously, you know, you don't footnote in fiction. Yeah. I mean, with, with nonfiction, it is, um, it's built on that research. Um, in, in, in fiction, at least for me, it was inspired by. So there was a point where I had to, you know, I was like researching until I felt really, really comfortable. Like almost like I could talk, you know what I mean? Like right off the bat about the world. And then I sat down and write, but you almost had to throw it away. Do you know what I mean? Because it's not the world. You're not going for a similitude. You know, you're not trying to say, this is literally how it was at this point in time. Right. But you want the person to feel like this is how it could have been experience. And there's a trick of memory in there. I mean, even how people remember it as it was is not how it was. Right. You know, there is no how it was. It's only the stories we tell, you know. And so um, I wanted this to feel like a believable story that was told, um, which is very, very different than, you know, making sure your dates, uh, you know, here and here. This person said that, checking out your quotes and all that. It's a very, very different thing. Um, with that in mind, what was, because this book, if I'm not mistaken, came, you started after your first book. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, so before Between the World and right. before Case for Reparations, yeah. How did you, I mean, I, this is maybe a career trajectory question, um, but what was, what was the plan? Was the plan to put this book out next? <laughs> there were many plans. <laughs> um, so I, the original plan was I was going to write a novel, and then I got signed up to write a book of nonfiction essays about the Civil War. But I felt like all the energy I had to write about the Civil War was actually going into what became this book. And I came to my editor's office and told him I wanted to you know, publish fiction next. Um, if anybody knows about what the general prospects are for first time fiction in the audience, um, you can imagine the, uh, the uh, flop sweat yeah. that descended upon my editor. Um, it, was, it was not the most pleasant of conversations. Um, but then, as it happened, I got this idea from Between the World and Me. And so I ended up writing Between the World and Me, so that became that book. And then we you know, started thinking, okay, so what are we going to do next? And I still had the fiction, he's very much into the fiction, and so we came up with this idea to do We Were Eight Years in Power, and then um, the novel after that. But basically, I would just go back. Every time I was finished a project, I finished something big at the Atlantic, I would automatically just revert back to the nonfiction. You know, the hardest thing was the fear that it was going to go away. Right. And I remember talking to our Chris, my editor, and I said, listen, I'm, I'm just, I'm scared this will never happen. Like, it's just going to get lost. And he said, listen, it's going to be fine. If it goes away, it was supposed to go away. It was never supposed to be published in the first place. And that proves so true. You know what I mean? He's just so right about that. Yeah, I think um, a joke I always tell, and it's not really a joke, is that every time I finish a poem, I, I feel like I can't believe I did that again. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, I, and more than that, I can't believe I, I'm going to undoubtedly have to do it again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and one day I will have to answer the, the, the fact that I won't have to do it again or I'm not able to do it again. Mm -hmm. How do you, um, well, how do you see yourself now? When you're done with this book and it's sitting in front of you and it's completed and it's had yeah, congrats on the New York Times bestseller, by the way. Um, where are you at now? What are you thinking in terms of, I can't believe I have to do this next, or I can't believe I might do this? Oh, I can't wait to do it again. Do you fix it again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love writing. It's a blast. I don't always love how it exists in the world. But I, 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 as you said, I love the research. I love the, the loneliness, the, the being by yourself. I love the discovery of things and holding those things close to you and, and you know, that, that you know, sort of excitement that it generates. I love how something can start off absolutely terrible, you know, <laughs> and end up, you know, um, as something that, you know, you consider beautiful. I, I, um, I don't, I don't know. I, I really, really enjoy writing fic fiction and nonfiction, and I can't wait to, you know, go back and, 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 and do this again. What? Um, I know, like, there are writers who talk about how much they hate writing. Yeah, I don't understand that. I don't understand that at all. I really, often no one's, like, making yeah, you do nobody's it. Nobody's you know making I mean? you do it. I mean, it is hard, yeah. but anything worth doing is hard, you know? Yeah. I mean, so I don't, I don't Whenever I see writers on some shit, like, I cannot believe I have to write another sentence, yes. it's like, well, you know. You don't have to. You don't have to. You actually don't have to. <laughs> 
I work in a diner. I did that. You know, I came out. Exactly. Was, exactly. Yeah. You get a job. You just get right yeah. a job. I can't believe I get to work from home and write. Yeah, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, but I also do want to. I mean, several writers have various struggles. Mm. Um, like you said, you don't always. It's it's enjoyable, but not always great. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So, what are some um, what are some struggles you saw yourself running to into as you transitioned or you worked as, as you juggled both nonfiction and fiction? Yeah, I mean, that wasn't so hard. What is always hard with books is, and I'm just, I, I don't know if all writers are like this, but uh, most of my writing happens on, on, on rewrite, which means I, I have to rewrite whole books. Um, so I wrote this four times. Really? Yeah. <laughs> but you know what's cool? Every time you rewrite, you think this is the one. Yeah. <laughs> it's like re-entering a, like re a bad yeah, yeah. relationship. I mean, and you really believe that. Like, so yeah. it's not like the second time you're like, good God, two more to go. Yeah. <laughs> you really, <laughs> you think you got it. <laughs> so no, nah, I had, uh, you know, there, there, there are four versions, you know, three really bad ones. And um, that's just how it is, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's tough. I mean, it, it's, it's tough to, you know, put all of that down. It's the same with Between the World and Me. I rewrote Between the World and Me, I think, like four times. You know, um, I will say it's different when you write a 30,000-word a book versus in a 130,000-word book. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little different. But nonetheless, you know, um, <laughs> even when I, like, when I got, so when I got the, the, the probably third draft of this, sat on my editor, he said, listen, this is not working. But we went through why, and he gave me some, you know, assignments to read. And I went back and read some stuff that had originally inspired. And God, there was this moment. There's this book I love by E.L. Doctorow called Billy Bathgate, incredible book. And Doctorow is just a, a, a beautiful, like, like a um, rhythmic writer. Like he writes like like a rapper. I mean, he just has this beautiful sense of timing and rhythm in his words. And I wanted something approaching that in the book. You know, I was trying to, you know, find that in the book. And I, I never forget, I was finishing up, and at this point I had read the two other uh, uh, books that Chris had, had, you know, had me read. And I was finishing up Billy Bathgate, and I was sitting in Washington Square Park, and I was just sitting there, and I got to the end, and I just felt like this incredible energy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I knew I had it. I knew, I said, I, I got it now. Like, I, I knew, like, what... I had to do, and I could hear the voice in a way, and in a detailed way, and in a very specific way. Um, and so that time I was, you know, like, okay, let, let, let's go. Now, of course, I had probably felt that way three times before that. <laughs> but, you know, like I said, there, there are harder ways to make a living. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll have to remind myself of that when I'm on, <laughs> when I'm on draft three of, of something that's 100,000 words. Um, what, in terms of... I was overjoyed to see Harriet Tubman in the book. I think America has yet to reckon with the fullness of Harriet Tubman because America has yet to reckon with slavery. So in order to, of course, um, I think Harriet Tubman is fascinating because in order for America to fully reckon with the miraculous life of Harriet Tubman, they would have to first reckon with the fact that they were slaves that needed to be free, right? Um, and so what did, what was your, was Harry Tubman in every draft of the book or did Harry Tubman come yeah, in? Yeah, Harry Tubman was in every draft. So early on you decided that, what was the decision like on that? Is, is, was it kind of the thing where it's like, if I represent- Wait, let me correct that. All right, Harry Tubman was in, cause they were versions of this. There were right. versions of this where there was a totally different cast of characters. Yeah. By the time I got to Hiram, Harry Tubman was in every draft after that. That's what I should say. Okay. What was the, um, because undoubtedly, a different writer or someone with a different interest in history could have built this entire ecosystem around Hiram in the various ideas of freedom in conduction and memory. Um, but your insertion of Harriet Tubman felt very good for me, but I was also interested in what, what drove you that direction. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, 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 as a writer, I, I, I feel like I had these like really trashy roots, you know, like I love genre fiction, I love adventure stories, comic yeah. books, all, all of that stuff. And I, I just saw this opportunity to do like this Obi-Wan, you know, Luke Skywalker thing, you know, <laughs> you know, like wax on, wax off, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> and I just, you know, I just thought that, you know, I love that stuff. <laughs> it was just fun. 
It was just really, really fun. And I think like when I pictured her, like when I read all the stories, like, I, like in my mind, I saw like a, a, a Gandalf, right. you know, sort of figure. Like that was how she came across, you know what I mean? Um, and I just kind of wrote from that, you know? It was just fun. I mean, I just, I just had a blast doing it. Um, so much of what frustrates me when I think about gentrification, for example, mm. right? Slavery falls on it. So we're going to get back to slavery, I promise. Uh, but what frustrates me about gentrification is that it's often seen as a, and I'm from an area that is just aggressively gentrifying and has been gentrified. Um, it's seen often as a material exchange. Mm. Um, like there was a building that was something else and now it's mm -hmm. a mall. Um, but the human cost of it isn't often talked about as, as eagerly. And the generational cost of it, what does it mean for someone to not identify the place they grew up? What does it mean for their people to not be able to identify where their people came from? Just on a, on a, on a landscape, on a, in a landscape idea. Slavery also, of course, is something that is talked about as though it is this broad specter of America that had no generational impact, right? It's just like a bad thing to wag our fingers at and then turn our backs towards, right? Um, what I really valued about this book is that at the core, it's a love story in, in many ways. Um, a love story that is, of course, propelled by um, this backbone that details the horrors of slavery, but it, it really does an effective job at humanizing each of the characters and their concerns, right? Their concerns around loss and grief and memory and distant love. Um, how important was it for you? I mean, I know that there's a variation to this answer that I know already, but how important was it for you to breathe full life into each character um, as yeah. opposed to just kind of shoving them into the machine of slavery and having them turn along? Yeah, I, you know, I, I talk about this a lot. Um, I, I don't think people realize the extent to which um, the, the world of the arts um, and the world of American myth, like the extent to which they are, you know, backbones to, to white supremacy. Um, we, we have a vision of our politics that basically says politics begins with a voter registration drive and ends in a, in, in a, in a, in a you know, voting booth. Um, and we, I don't think we always focus on the, the, the factors around us that are shaping those choices. So, you know, when I was talking up there about, you know, Amber Geiger and, and you know, the forgiveness, so that, that's, that's politics. But it's not laws that made that happen per se, or, or it's not, you know, um, the words, you know, written in the laws or the penalties or the codes, or, that's not what made it happen. It's a ongoing narrative of what it means to be a white woman that began in 1619. And that narrative is told in stories, it's told in art, it's told in poetry, it's told in movies, and it's been retold so often. I'm gonna get in trouble, but forget it. Um, <clears throat> it's been retold so often that it's tough to know, you know where the line is when you're making your own decision and when you're actually acting on something that's basically, you know, has the weight of generations on it and has been imprinted in your brain from the you know, time you, you, you were born. So just as that there's a, this narrative you know, of, of white womanhood that extends back, there's a narrative of, of black malehood, a black man or a black masculinity that extends in the same way. And so you know, when I was saying up there, it's tough for me to imagine my son committing that crime. And even black people acting like that. Mm -hmm. That's the way to narrative. That's the way to his. That's not, that's not just policy. That's not just you know, mass incarceration. You know? Except it is mass incarceration. The reason we have mass incarceration. Right. Because you have to be able to picture somebody right. in, in a certain way. Uh, you know, I wrote this, this, this piece when I was at the Atlantic on mass incarceration in the black family. And what became very, very clear is what was important was not just the history in the sense of the laws that were being passed, but the way black people were talked about in those discussions. So there's a very, very long history of associating black freedomhood, the idea of wanting black independence with criminality. 
I mean, literally during the era of slavery, you know, it was a literal scientific theory that runaway slaves su suffered from some sort of disorder. And so when you think about how we're going to unravel that, right? I mean, that's a lot of weight. That's a lot of weight. I mean, how do you unravel Gone with the Wind? How do you unravel, you know, uh, uh, Birth of a Nation? People don't know this, but Birth of a Nation literally uh, sparked the second iteration of the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan had terrorized people in, in, in the South. That actually wasn't the same Ku Klux Klan, you know, from the 19th century. Just the one that comes out of Birth of a Nation, came out of a movie. So how do we untangle that? How, how do we, you know, unravel that? And I don't know that you can do it by outlining a set of facts. You know, I, I don't know that you can do it by, by saying, you know, listen, you know, Civil War started in this year, it was about this, about that. People's minds shut off, man. They're not really hearing you because their imagination is constrained and who they can extend uh, uh, the umbrella of humanity to is constrained. And it's constrained by centuries of stories. And so, you know, when I came to this, I, I thought that I had this, this great opportunity actually I mean, to put it bluntly, to expand a war that, you know, I had, you know, began, you know, in, in, in nonfiction and in journalism to get to something, you know, deeper to tell, you know, different stories, because I, I, I don't see how you can pass new laws. I, I don't see how you can elect different politics. I don't see how you can enact this agenda that so many of us want if you don't believe people are, are human at, at their core. Um, one more question, then I want to talk about rap. Um, <laughs> but I'm interested in, um, you know, I was talking to one of my friends yesterday about the struggle between um, interjecting the idea of being a public figure, even if you cannot negotiate that, right? Um, or even if people begin to look to you for answers that you don't always have or don't feel obligated to give, right? Um, how did you find, um, did you find yourself in any way retreating from nonfiction because of the, uh, demands of, and I don't mean retreating like you'll never write it again, but I mean kind of like, um, you know, not just the leaving or the Atlantic, but really working on fiction, did you find yourself retreating heavier into fiction because you felt like it did not require you to be a public figure who also wrote, but really a writer who just happened to have good answers for things? Yeah, um, I did. <laughs> um, and I, I'm still thinking about this. Like, I still haven't quite figured this out. Um, what I do know is, and, and I don't know if, like, there's this sort of, like, honorary nonfiction writer chair that, yeah. you know, like, Richard Wright has occupied or Baldwin occupied. I mean, one would argue Frederick Douglass occupied. And then, you know, you, you write something that people really like, and they think, oh, you know what I mean, you must, you must want to sit in that chair. But I only want to sit in my own chair, you know? Like, I don't, um, I don't have, you know. And, and I never did. You know, Between the World of Me was, for me, primarily, more so than Case for Reparations, a literary act. You know, like, it, it came out of an attempt to grapple with something through literature. Um, it, it wasn't, um, and, and I'm happy that people derive certain things from that. But I, it was very hard to get people to see it as a piece of writing. Mm. Um, and it was very hard to get, I shouldn't say that. It was very hard to get some people to see it as, as a piece of writing. I don't want to, you know, ignore, you know, because certainly, you know, tons of people do. It, and it was very hard to get people to judge it by, some people to get, judge it by the kind of laws and criteria that we normally judge art and literature. Um, you know, I talk about this all the time, but the whole question, that, that is a ridiculous question to put to any artist. Absolutely you ridiculous would be, question. they would, you know, you would be laughed out of the room for that. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess, wanted that same thing even in my, in my nonfiction. I wanted the ability to be that, that same kind of you know, truth teller. In fact, I would actually argue that even for historians, you would be laughed out of the room if you act, told some historian, why is your book so depressing? You know, I mean... <laughs> and you know what? I also think like some of this has to do with the interplay between our religiosity and, and Christianity and black identity in this country, um, which I, I don't really have a quarrel with. Mm -hmm. It's just that that wasn't how I came up. Right. 
I'm not out of that tradition. So I don't, I don't like have the same, I, I, I you know, I literally, and I, I don't mean any, you know, this in any sort of disrespectful way, but I literally do not understand the Christian philosophy of Martin Luther King. Like, I can't, I can't get to it. I don't, I don't understand, you know, love thy enemy. Right, right. This idea of persevere with love and through one door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with that, the notion that the job of any black person who is right. speaking is to give hope. Right. You know, also that I, gives a lot of credit to the enemy always, right? Yes, it does. Yeah, love by enemy gives a lot of credit. A to, lot of to credit. What the enemy is yeah, and of. I would argue it kind of mocks the the idea of love in the first Absolutely. place. Yeah. You know, um, but having said that, having said that, you know, be that as it may, I, I just I I couldn't give the answers people were wanting. You know, um, and I, and so even now, like you know, I have other nonfiction ideas, but um, I. I, I I don't know, man. <laughs> it's going to be tough to go back. Uh, yeah. Well, when you do, I'll still be there hanging out probably because I can't write fiction. Um, Are you sure? Yeah, I can't write fiction. I don't know. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I know, I'm, not, I know, I'm not flattering. I, I think people um, practice things. Yeah. You know, you obviously everybody, you know, you need a requisite level of talent, you know, but I don't think talent is enough. I think, you know, I'm a strong, strong believer in work and practice. So, I mean, whether you want to <laughs> is a whole different question, but yeah. I have a hard time believing that you can't. Um, I think about Toni Morrison all the time. Um, the greatest Ohioan, perhaps, or not perhaps, easily the greatest Ohioan. Like Toni Morrison, and then much further down, I think perhaps LeBron James. Um, <laughs> And then John Glenn somewhere. Um, and then near the bottom, all the presidents. Um, <laughs> but there was this, what I loved about Toni Morrison the most that I, that I wish more people talked about when we lost her um, was how eagerly she rejected the idea of genius. Mm -hmm. yeah. And because to give in to the idea of genius is also to give in to the idea of scarcity. Right? Yes. And yes. scarcity is a true enemy of accountability. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, and so I, I really do want to say before I ask you a rap question, uh, that I really appreciate how, how I see that reflected in your, not just your work, but the way you move through the world as well. It also, it also uh, denigrates work. Yeah. Like it really, it's just like, it's this idea that some people have it and some people right. don't. That is the worst, you know, message in a way. It's a particularly horrible message for young people. Like it's a terrible yeah. thing to say. And it's a, um... <laughs> and, as most black people have, if you have lived through points in your life where the world did not regard you as any kind of genius at all, it is stunning, and I'm talking about myself now, <laughs> to be 40 years old and to look around and you know what I mean, suddenly now, was it that you, know, you were a genius all along? Or is it that you shouldn't necessarily, you know, uh, embrace the, the labels idea, yeah. that people put on you in the first place? Right. The yeah. very idea of genius narrows the scope, I think, of what particularly marginalized writers can be, or artists in general. Yeah. And it also, if you don't make someone repeatedly earn this label that you place That's on right. them. That's right. You know what I mean? That's it right. creates a debt. And then yeah. you get uh, late career Kanye West. Yeah. <laughs> It creates a debt. Yeah, anyway. What, <laughs> what, what were the albums you loved growing up? Why are y'all booing? He's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I forgot I'm in a Chicago adjacent place, but. Come on now. Come on. <laughs> come on now. Um, what, what rap albums were you big on growing up? Oh, man. Um, really quickly, you know what's sad about Kanye? Just really, really quick. Cool. No, How I, much time know, do we have? <laughs> no, but you know what I didn't get? Because like when he first, when he came out, he was going and he was, you know, saying all this stuff. And I, I did not want to say it was mental illness. You always, you know, wary of diagnosing people, even though it yeah. kind of looked like that. And, you know, later he, you know, admitted that it was that. The sad thing for me was I was, I was teaching this class. It was the first semester I was teaching this class. And I had kids in my class, they're about 20 years old. And it was only at that moment that I realized that they never, there were people in my class, in a college class, who did not remember music before Kanye. He yeah. had been good that long. Yeah. Like he had been, like he was, I mean, don't take, like Kanye's remarkable. 
remarkable. I mean, this like I come from an era where people, you know, burn. Big Daddy Kane burns for like two two years and then was gone. Yeah. And that was normal. And I love Kane. Like I love Kane. Like Kane, you know, this dude, like. And you forget it because if you are an adult when it happens, like time moves differently than when you're right. a child. You know what I mean? And so, like, I didn't get the weight of what he said until I considered that this dude has been walking with these kids all their lives. Yeah, and there's, I mean, it, it's some of this too, my joke aside, well, not joke, but my statement aside, is about a relationship of fandom, right? Who shepherds mm -hmm. you through, right? Who carries you through, and then that too creates a debt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because we all have an artist or a writer or a person mm -hmm. who has shaped us, and then the question is, well, what do we owe in defense of that person through all their modes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the work of, I mean, I think part of this is my philosophy that the work of a fan is to love themselves more than the people they idolize. Yes, yes. Um, even if the person they idolize helps shape that version right, of themselves. Right, right. But I think about Kanye West and how, I think about the first three albums all the time. And not only were they good, but they seemed so easy for him, yeah. right? I think that was so, I think particularly Graduation mm -hmm. as this harrowing precursor to what was to come, this whole album about how fame was, was all consuming and something bad was on the horizon and his mother dies like a couple weeks after it drops and then he has to kind of move through the world mm -hmm. with some kind of weight attached mm -hmm. to his fame. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, I mean, in some ways it is heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is, and, and it's not um, unusual within the history of black artists. I mean, that, that, that's the other thing. And it, it just hits us a kind of way, you know, because we're, we're already down. Um, I'm not ducking your question though. <laughs> um, okay, what did I love? So I went through periods, you know? I mean, um, I think like public enemy, it takes a nation of millions to hold us back. Like that just, that really expanded, like yeah. for me, like what was possible. Like I was like, like, and I'm yeah. talking about like, not just from what it was saying, but aesthetically, like the way it sounded, I had yeah. never heard anything that sounded like that. And I did it, that was actually could be music, you know what I mean? Just, I mean, it was so chaotic and, you know, some jumbled and everything. So that, that probably was a big one. Um, anytime Rakim said anything <laughs> was always, you know, um, I I incredible. I mean, it's like the simplest thing, you know, I can take a phrase that's rarely heard, flip yeah. it, now it's a daily, daily word. word. That's Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like the job of writing is to inject as much emotion and feeling as you can in, in, into words. And I always felt like the best rappers because they were bounded by a beat, like really had to be good at that. You know what I mean? Right. It, it really trained them to be you know, excellent at that. So, I mean, um, the Roots, um, especially the second and the third album, you know, Black Thought had a huge, huge influence on me. Um, Wu-Tang, it goes without saying. Um, that, that first Raekwon album, Big, yeah. big, big influence. Purple um, Illmatic, big, big, big influence. And, and these were, and again, like as a writer, like they shaped how I thought about words, how I thought about language, you know? Right. Um, there are lines in this book that I can think of and I read them and I know they basically are sampling rappers. Like I can remember something I heard from a rapper and that stuck with me and I was, you know, doing something like that. Yeah. What are you listening to now, rap wise? Nothing. Nothing? <laughs> no, nah, I like, no, nah, I actually need your help. I'm old, man. You know, one of the sad things about, you know, you just don't have as much time as you did when you were a kid True. and you can't, yeah. you don't have as much time to like cycle through and the same, like, hey man, when I was like, how? I mean, you would go all day sitting in your dorm room, just listening. And yeah. you know, it makes for like a, you know, a great ear and a, and a great critic. I mean, the last thing I probably really, really liked um, was that Travis Scott album. Um, that, uh, the Benny the Butcher. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, um, but I just, I'm like not the person to ask about that, you know? Do you not listen to stuff when you travel? I do, but it's old. I mean, it's old <laughs> yeah. because the problem is like you have to take the, like anything. The time to consume the Yes, yeah, yes, and, like, yes. And then you're, like, if you don't like it right away, that's actually not a statement of whether it's good or not. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because most of the stuff, I mean, I hated the first Public Enemy out first time. I and mean, God forbid I make my judgment the first time I heard it. You know what I mean? And so to really appreciate it, like any art, you gotta give you know folks time, and so it, it's hard, you know what I mean, to do that, yeah. you know, when you got you know a, a lot going on. Yeah. Unless you're paid to write about it, you know. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I mean I think streaming has also made it easier to dismiss 
right? Because I mean, you probably like went back to the public. Right? Some albums I stayed with because it was physically hard to stop listening. You know, yeah. like cassette tapes are hard to move through. Mm. The streaming is just like I can press a button and I'm on to the next yes, point. Yes, that's that's a good point. Like you kind of like you would have to like you got to actually do a fast yeah, forward, to, like, and then you got to wait. Yeah, you got to wait for and it then to kind of guess. There. Yeah, guess. Am I there yet? Guess where that's just gonna stop. Right. And then if you miss the mark, you like gotta rewind. Yeah. Yeah. Better just let it rock. Yeah, just let it rock. Just let it rock. I feel like we're probably at the point where, where questions have to happen. Because um, I audience questions and not my own. Oh, sure. I, did, I thought I was going over time. No, you're, you're, you know, how about you do another one? Do one more. <laughs> okay. What do you, um, this is a question that I ask a ton of, like many writers who I've loved reading and have had kind of long careers and have settled into some stage of academia. Um, what do you value about teaching? What do you value about, um, do you see yourself as a, a different teacher than you are a writer? Are your concerns different? Are your energies different? Yeah, I think like having to explain why something is working to someone who has no idea why it's working causes you to better understand why it's working. Mm -hmm. um, and so, if you, I mean, if I think if you're teaching right, you actually end up kind of teaching yourself. Yeah. You know, like there are things that you understand on an instinctual level, you've forgotten. You've forgotten how, you know, something actually, you know, is, is actually happening because, you know, it's become, got to the point of muscle memory. But it's worth remembering. It's worth remembering, you know, what, what's going on. It's worth remembering why. And then when something's bad, having to explain why, why it's bad, you know. Um, so for me, actually, it, it, it probably makes me uh, a better writer. Excellent. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. I'm looking at your career trajectory and I'm noticing that there is a kind of reoccurring theme around the imagination, mysticism, magic, supernatural powers, whether it's the comic books or this particular current book, you know, even with Between the World and Me, you know, when I'm, I mean, I went to Howard and I'm reading the chapter about Howard and I'm like, wow, that's a very mystical place, you know? And I'm wondering how do you show up in those those tropes when your own personal you know identity is one that's centered and grounded in a very uh you know a, a notion of atheism and i'm wondering how do you show up in that uh is it i'm just a writer and i'm writing about these things or do you find yourself um you know kind of wrestling with these ideas even when you don't find yourself actually believing them so i think um there is the belief system you adhere to uh, yourself, you know, mind, you know, one of atheism. But at the same time, taking the people you're writing about seriously, um, respecting other belief systems sounds like cliche. Um, it sounds like something you would get in a diversity workshop. Um, <laughs> nothing wrong with diversity workshops, but. It's not like that. Like, I, I, you just listen. I, I have, I have things that I think, but um, at this point in my life, I, you know, I understand that the, the things I think are not absolute knowledge. So that's the first thing. You know, um, the second thing is being aware of the ways in which you can make people feel something, and I. I as a writer, I like having access to the full range of, you know, um, you know, it's like being a painter. You know, I don't want to restrict my palette. So if mysticism is the way that I feel like I can get something across, um, I want to be able to use it. The thing is, sometimes things just feel magical, how it feels magical, you know? And I don't need to be able to prove that. I just have to feel it. So if I feel it, I'm, I'm trying to communicate it, you know, uh, uh, to other people as, as a writer. Um, I'm going to give a quick preamble too. We're going to try to give preference to younger folks in the room. So if you're a teenager, college student, get your hand up in the air and we'd love to come to you first. Like you, for example. Right there, I see you. Yep, that's you. Yep, that's you. You're the winner. <laughs> I'm going to want you to stand up <laughs> and keep the microphone close to your mouth. It better be good. No, I'm uh, just messing with you, I'm just messing with you. I, I ask your questions, it's all good, it's all good. All right, so you talked a lot about um, making people feel something through your writing, but I'm a high school junior, <laughs> and when we write stuff, we don't write stuff to make people feel something, we write stuff to, you know, get a good grade. <laughs> so 
for students that enjoy writing and really want to have a future in writing, uh, what kind of advice would you give when we write stuff for school that... Oh boy, you're not going to like this answer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I never figured that out. <laughs> I wasn't a good student. When I, in my junior year, I, I took seven classes and failed five of them. One of them mind. was English. <laughs> so I, I, I never figured that out. <laughs> and you're right, I mean, those are a lot of the assignments. You're not um, judged on how much emotional heft you, know, you can bring you know, to, 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 to write it. That's not, that's not what it's for. Um, so I don't know. You know, um, in fact, I suspect that you know better than me. You know, um, I just, I, I, I never, you know, writing for me was always an act of love. And so like um, the writing I was generally tasked with, with doing in school, I just, I, I, I never figured out how to connect with it, sorry. I got one. Sorry, teachers. <laughs> got another junior in high school, Quinn. Hi, how's it going? Um, my name is Quinn, I'm a junior here. and. Um, you mentioned The Last Poets and you mentioned Nas, um, both of who, uh, in their own ways, especially with like, The Last Poets talking about time and Nas, um, when he says sleep is the cousin of death, um, build this picture of blackness that challenges some of the ideas of blackness as being having access to um, this kind of human subjectivity and like specifically with you know, texts of black nihilism and Afro-pessimism that are becoming more popular in this kind of growing body of literature that kind of makes these arguments that blackness has some type of fundamental attachment to the position of the slave and that, that, that uh, positionality is hard to progress from. Um, and then you talk about how, uh, what happens when we try and, the violence that happens when we are unable to see people as human beings when you open up um, talking about you know, what's been in the news these past couple weekends. And so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on those ideas and also like how you understand and if it is possible for blackness and black subjects to be seen as human beings. See what I'm saying? See, this is, this is why I'm gonna stop writing nonfiction, right? You know, <laughs> sorts of questions, man. You know? Um, it's certainly possible, you know, I, I think it's definitely possible, um, but I think as your question hinted at, um, unfortunately, um, the need to regard black people as subhuman um, is deeply ingrained in, in, in this country's history, its culture, its practices, you know. Um, I just, I hate going back to that moment, but it's, it's a lot to learn from that. I was reading it, you know, just before I was coming, there was an article in the Times, and they were, you know, talking about this hug. And there was a black dude in Dallas, same area, did 10 years in jail for something he didn't do. He said, when the state found me, I said, ain't nobody give me a hug. <laughs> gave me a handshake and said, my bad. You know, um, this country has one of the most brutal prison systems in world history. Shorter. Yeah. In terms of its Just scope step up, step up. and the amount of suffering that it inflicts on people. It also warehouses huge numbers of black people. Outstanding. So, oh, great. Thanks. so even within the society, it, it serves a purpose. This is sociologist Diva Page, and she wrote, you know, the American prison system. If you were to let all of you know the black men who are incarcerated out right now, you would have enough people on the street to fill every job at McDonald's for five years straight. So what you see in that is, is, is a prison system that's serving a societal function. It's actually doing something within the, the society. And so the, the, the question of regarding black people as human is not one that's without consequence in the broader society. What it means is you would need a very, very different America. Um, you would be living in a very, very different country. Certain people would have much, much less money for instance. And so I'm hesitant to say it's not possible, but I think it's really, really important that people recognize like why it hasn't happened. That there are you know, really deeply embedded, hard structural reasons for why it's so hard to get to that. Okay. Stand up. Ta-Nehisi right here. I'm gonna hand the microphone to this guy. Keep it close to your mouth. 
Uh, hi, I'm a, I'm a sophomore at uh, here. <laughs> uh, so in your original, like, uh, in your original visit here uh, on the answer you mentioned uh, about the use of the N-word, you use the F slur as a point, as a tool for a, for a larger point in, the, in uh, that answer. So I was just curious as, as someone currently in a heterosexual relationship on like, where do you think the line falls uh, for ownership of certain the words? S -word. The S-slur. The F-slur. I'm sorry. The F-slur? F-A-G-G-O-T? in Frank. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, sorry, I thought I heard S. I was like, what's the S word? So, this is me, right? I see you. If you are using the word nigger to explain something, for instance, the word nigger appears in Huckleberry Finn. You know, like if that's the sentence you're using. Um, to me, that's very, very different than saying he's a nigger. That's even, even very different than a white person saying to me, you're my nigger. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like it's a different sort of context. The thing I was trying to make clear, you know, in that um, answer is that all words have context. It's not that white people should never, ever use that word. It's just that they don't get to use it like black people use it. That's, that's the difference. It's not that there's no you know, sort of you know, conscious. I actually deeply, I mean, this is just me. This is me. I actually deeply resent the N-word. Like, I actually, the construction of the N-word. You know, um, because I think it insults, like, the intelligence. The problem is we don't, like, extend to black people the same type of context that we extend to other people. I use a number of other words you know, in that explanation. For instance, I use the word baby, right? I talk about the relationship between myself and my wife, and it's okay you know, to use baby in this context. You know, but it doesn't mean that baby, it doesn't mean that you need to go around saying the B word. It's just that we can understand the context. You know? And so, as I said, I think you know, in, a, in a privileged you know, position, you know, when you're singing a song where somebody is using that word in a kind of celebratory way. It's worth withholding for a moment. The F word is all through hip hop, like all through. And, you know, I've had to learn how to withhold that, <laughs> you know, how to, you know, listen and just, you know, not do what I would have done 20 years ago, you know? And so I think like the main thing is just to understand, you know, the usage of the word within the context. I think that's, that, that's the bigger thing. I don't really believe in absolute complete bans on language. Does that make sense? Marcus, you have someone? Yep. So I'm not in high school, but I'm still kind of young. Um, <laughs> Enjoy it. Thank you. <laughs> that was not last. <laughs> um, but I, <laughs> I grew up in Southern Maryland, and so I was reading about your research okay. process, and you were visiting plantations, and you were saying a lot of times in Civil War battlefields that you were the only person of color visiting um, and specifically, I was thinking about Monticello and these places that still kind of bury slavery um, and they glamorize the plantations. And I wanted to know, or, or just beginning to share it, how did it feel when you were researching and then exploring and seeing in real life these plantations? Yeah, it was really emotional. I mean, Monticello specifically was, um, was really, really hard. Um, Monticello is a great place. More black people should go to Monticello. Um, I couldn't have written this book without the help of the historians and the you know, uh, archaeologists at, at Monticello. Um, but it's also a deeply conflicted place because people hold weddings there. They hold wine tastings there. You know, the kids you know, run around as though they're in an amusement park. And if you're black, you know, you're, you're very much aware that you are in a uh, forced labor camp. And so it, 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 it's hard to get to. One of the good things is some of the professionals and people who work there you know, have begun to you know, realize this and they're actually grappling you know, with, with the problem, which is you know, good, good to see. Um, the thing that you get from visiting the actual site is the, the emotion of it. Like you can really, really feel it. I mean, you walk inside a slave cabin and there's certain sensations that you get, gain access to. 
And it's difficult, at least I found it very, very difficult to write strictly through books without that, you know, emotion. Because I guess, you know, again, one of the big differences is, is you know, there's emotion in nonfiction, but in fiction, you, you really gotta feel it. Like, you really gotta be there. You can't, you know, rely on, you can't, you know, just retreat into the world of fact in the same way you can in nonfiction. So, I mean, it was one of my favorite, you know, portions of, of working on a book, you know? Um, and it was just a point where once I had it, and once I had that feeling, once I had access to it, I just had to kind of put the, you know, the research away and then just go right. Okay, back here in the center. Stand up and keep it close to your mouth. Okay. Hi, so I'm a junior at DePaul College Prep and currently in our literature class, we're reading your memoir, Between the World and Me. And it has been an extremely enriching and eye-opening um, book to the history of our country. And I just want, was wondering how you think the book has affected different generations in different ways. Oh God, you had to tell me. <laughs> You have to tell me. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's like, you know, you write something and then um, that's it. You know, you just kind of leave it there, you know? Um, I mean, you, you don't just kind of leave it there, but you can't. What I wanted out of that book and what I was thinking when I wrote that book was so grounded in the process of actually getting the book done. Um, like, I just didn't want the book to fail. And by fail, I don't mean like not sell a lot. I mean literally fail, like be unpublishable. You know, um, and Hanif was saying, you know, this idea of genius, with it comes this notion that you just kind of spit things out. You know what I mean? Because you're a genius. And it obviates the fact that there's like you have to actually work. You actually have to, you know, get things to, you know, go a certain way. And so it's hard for me to step out of myself and, and, and look at the work like this and then look at the world. You know, it, it, the right is almost in a fishbowl. You create the thing and then it goes out. And um, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, a fair number of people have read it. I'm aware of that. Um, I'm happy about that. <laughs> um, I hope it's done some good. Marcus, one second. Um, we have time for two more questions. We have been put on notice. We have take that question. We'll take one more question. A quick notice. There's going to be there's a book for sale for um, Hanif Abdurraqib. There are some out sale. Oh, okay. Well, you know what I'm trying to say. There are some for sale out there. I think they're also going to sell here on stage. The book sign will be here. And just a reminder that Hanif is going to do um, he's going to do some poetry for us once Tanahasi leaves the stage. So stay put if you can. So Marcus, go ahead. Um, hi, I'm Alana Stone and I'm a junior. My question is that you wrote in your book, Between the World and Me, that quote, black life is cheap, but in America, black bodies are a natural resource of incomparable value, end nice quote. Question. As a black man raising a black son in this day and age, how would you break that down to your son and other black individuals and explain the value of their black body? Um. <laughs> This is what I mean, like I have to get these. I would tell them to read the rest of the book. <laughs> That's it, I wouldn't, I'd say, you know, they say, I don't understand that. Well, here's the book, you should read the rest of the book. Um, I wouldn't do much more than that. You know what I mean? I'm a big fan of reading and people thinking things through, you know? Um, this is what I like, when we were talking earlier about this role as a nonfiction writer, I always feel like as in, like in answering the questions I, I can't completely fulfill the expectation, <laughs> you know? Um, like the, the question requests something that's beyond, you know, like what writers actually do. Which, and you're not wrong, I just wanna be clear about that. You know, I'm not, you know, ragging on you for, for asking that question, but the book is the limits of my powers. Like that, that's who I am, that, 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 that's what I do. Um, I can't do much more. So I probably would just tell them to read the book, I guess. And then last question right here. Do you see me, Tanasi? Right here. Okay, good. Stand up, and then keep it close to your mouth. Okay. Um, hello. I am 12, and I go to the school in the suburbs. But my question was that you said that um, you just did a lot of Civil War stuff, but I was wondering if you did anything outside of the Civil War, but you related it to events that were leading up to the Civil War, like the Revolutionary War. Or Something like that, like in between. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Forgive me. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Um, but 
did you like research anything in between the Civil War and like something further back? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, for you know my other work, you know, for Between the World and Me, I mean, obviously, it didn't begin, you know, with the Civil War. Um, case for reparations, you know, begins with you know the, literally the founding of America. Um, so yeah, I would say I would say yes. It's just I probably find the Civil War particularly provocative in, in a very very specific way. Okay, that's it for tonight. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you.